So on November 12, 2016, there were two rallies in New York City. This was a few days after the US presidential election. And both of these rallies were organized on Facebook. One of them was called the Not My President Rally, opposing Donald Trump. The other one was called Support President-Elect Donald Trump. And these two rallies were held a couple miles apart. And then at a certain point, according to news reports, the anti-Trump rally began marching up Fifth Avenue until it encountered the pro-Trump rally right outside of Trump Tower. And there was not a polite interaction. It was an unhappy event. What nobody involved knew, no one on either side of this rally, what no one knew was that the rallies had actually been organized, at least in part, by the same people. The same people put up these Facebook ads for both rallies, the pro and anti-Trump rallies. And according to the United States Justice Department, the people were the Internet Research Agency, a Russian operation in St. Petersburg that had been active for four years in influencing US political debate. This indictment, which was issued in February just this year, gives several examples. For example, the Facebook page of the Tennessee Republican Party. This is fake. The actual Tennessee Republican Party also has a Facebook page, but it was less popular than the fake one that was utilized by the operatives in St. Petersburg. There was also a group called Blacktivist, which was a mirror of Black Lives Matter or of racial justice campaigners. Again, it was run out of St. Petersburg. Both of these fake sites and, and several others, about 30 others, were used according to the US Justice Department for the purpose of spreading distrust toward the candidates and the political system in general. Now this was big, big news in February of this year. It was big news in Canada where I live. I imagine it was big news in Europe as well. And it was especially big news in the United States. And so what I was interested in was the way that hearing about the use of bots and uh, fake pages on social media, hearing about how that affected how Americans engage in political debate with one another online. And so I started looking for examples. So I'm going to show you some examples. These are from uh, public Facebook pages of news media in the week after the news came out. And as it happened, there was a big news event and a debate that week. That same week, a young man took weapons into a high school in, in, uh, in uh, Parkland, Florida, and attacked some former classmates and students. And this reignited debate in the United States about what to do about guns. So on these public Facebook pages, people began arguing, what should Americans do about guns? So for example, here's someone named RJ, who is arguing that there should not, in fact, be gun control because you couldn't stop the shooter. You don't have to worry too much about exactly what RJ says. The, example, the point is just that here's RJ giving RJ's opinion. And someone named John responds to RJ with a message in Russian, apparently. If you can't read Russian like me, you could, you could use Facebook's translation program. And what it tells you is that John said, your check by mail, comrade. That same week, on another website, this is the CBS News website, there were further debates about gun control. Here's a different person named John saying, basically giving a conspiracy theory. Again, the details don't matter too much. You don't have to read the whole thing. The idea is just here's a conspiracy theory about how this is secretly Obama and the FBI perpetuating attacks to encourage gun control. And somebody else responds to this with, the Russian bot is strong in this one. So you have several different people who see someone else making an argument, a political argument, whether or not you agree with it isn't the point, making a political argument and dismissing it on the grounds that it's just a bot. And the really scary thing is they weren't totally wrong to be thinking this way. From that very same week, here's a BBC article, there were in fact that very same week, February of 2018, this year, there were Russian bots active on Twitter and social media engaging in spurious arguments about gun control to try to drive division in American politics. One last example of this phenomenon, this is another thing on, on the Fox News Facebook page, and this is a person talking about their own personal opinions about President Trump. And, um, and so this is this, someone's personal opinion about Donald Trump. You don't have to read the whole thing. The point is that here is a discussion of what somebody thinks of Donald Trump. And then in response, a whole lot of people add their opinions. Troll, troll, oh look, a Russian troll, shh, troll, go away. Oh look, a deep state shrill, and Brian is not real, paid troll. So we have this over and over again. This is all in the same week, just in one week. On, these are public comments on social media. And they're all around the same theme. And this theme goes back to something that's been in the internet from the beginning. You might recognize this, a very famous New Yorker cartoon from 25 years ago. The caption is, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. The other problem we have now is that on the internet, no one knows you're not a bot. Anybody who disagrees with you, who thinks you're wrong, who thinks you're making a mistake, doesn't have to engage with your opinion if they can dismiss it as just being a bot, or as being a fake account, or as being a troll. 
So we're at this really difficult stage with social media discourse, which might have been a great political tool for people to be, have, be able to have all kinds of conversations and be able to have political debate across an entire country, where instead social media is driving us towards dismissing other people's opinions. So I'm, I'm a philosophy professor. I think about these things in terms of philosophical theories, and I wanted a framework for thinking about this. So I'm gonna borrow a framework from the British philosopher Bernard Williams. This is from a paper about 30 years ago. Williams talks about three different conceptions of what politics could be. And he focuses, helpfully for us, around the idea of making errors and mistakes. The question is, how do we react to other people when we think they've done something wrong, when we think they're wrong about something? And he thinks that our reactions to other people are what constitute or structure what our political system is like. So one type is what he calls the politics of mirror control. And the idea here is when somebody makes a mistake, they have to be fixed, like they're a leaky faucet or a broken down car. Just fix them no matter what it takes. He calls this a, a politics fit for slaves or servants. His second, his second idea is the politics of acknowledgement. And the politics of acknowledgement says people can make mistakes and maybe we have to give them a chance to excuse themselves and fix their behavior, but in the end, they still have to do what we tell them to do. Maybe we temporarily give them a, a chance to fix themselves, but in the end, they have to do what we say. And he calls this a politics fit for, fit for subjects, like with a king or an autocrat. And the third type is the politics of communal deliberation. The idea here is in the politics of communal deliberation, when I disagree with somebody, when I think you're doing something wrong, when I see you're violating a rule, you get to disagree with me back. You get to say, no, the rule shouldn't be that way. I'm not just wrong, I disagree. I think the rule should be changed. Maybe you're the one who's wrong. It's only this last conception that's a democratic conception of politics and how we handle error. It's that we all have to allow that when we disagree, there's some room for pushback. The other person can say to us, I disagree. So I wanna use this framework to think about what social media is doing to us. And I wanna suggest there's at least three different ways in which social media is changing us, pushing us away from this ideal politics of communal deliberation. We take other people's disagreements seriously. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through a couple of different ways I think this is happening. The first one I've already talked to you about, this is what I'm calling the lost presumption of sincerity. It's the way in which if you disagree with somebody, you can just announce they're a troll or announce they're a bot. They're not someone you really have to engage with. They don't matter to the debate because they're not even real. Second problem here is what I call the entertainmentization of discourse. This is where we treat what's supposed to be a serious discussion about how to decide our politics together as just an opportunity for entertainment or for money. So the idea here is that traditional media radio, TV, made money off of passive receivers. We sit there and we, we listen and we watch, and advertisements are fed to us, and money's made off of advertisements while we watch and pay attention. Social media makes money off of active engagement. Social media requires, in fact, it benefits the most when we all are constantly actively participating, when we are posting angry comments or po clicking the like button or the unhappy face button. We're doing something. It's the us doing something that keeps social media going, and that's what makes money for social media companies. Roger McNamee, who was an earlier investor in Facebook, talked about this in New York Magazine. He said, they're basically trying to trigger fear and anger to get the outrage cycle going, because outrage is what makes you be more deeply engaged. You spend more time on the site and you share more stuff. Therefore, you're going to be exposed to more ads and that makes you more valuable. It's the anger, it's the engagement that drives the value of social media, not necessarily the quality of what you're saying. Here's an example of this from that same week in February regarding the gun control debate in the United States. These are two journalistic publications. The one on the left is the National Review. The National Review is a conservative publication, but it's widely respected across the aisle in the United States. It's seen as a mainstream conservative publication that obeys standards of journalistic ethics and is generally regarded as, as thoughtful. The publication on the right is Breitbart. If you haven't heard of Breitbart, it's a, what was, used to be regarded as a very fringe, extreme uh, publication. Its former editor is Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's once close advisor, and it tends to engage in excitable and often not quite true discourse. So both of these publications are talking about what role the survivors of the Parkland shooting had in national gun control debates. And the National Review took a conservative stance, but a reasonable stance, a thoughtful stance. Whereas Breitbart engaged in some conspiratorial thinking, it even indulged the thought that maybe there had been no shooting and they were quote unquote crisis actors who were paid to pretend to have been at a shooting. Now, if you look at the engagement figures on these two posts, you see something interesting. That's the lower left-hand corner. I don't know if you can see the numbers. The number of people who responded to the National Review sober reporting is 366. The number of people who respond to Breitbart's more excitable reporting on the same topic is 8,000. 
366 to 8,000. It's writing the more excited and anger-inducing stuff, the stuff that gets you pressing the anger button or writing something about it or sharing it to your friends and saying how terrible this is. That's the stuff that gets the attention and that's the stuff that, gets, that generates money for advertisers on social media. So that's the second problem. The third problem is what I'm calling an eroding norm of testimony. I have to explain a bit what I mean by this. And in case you're interested, this is coming from a paper I wrote, so if you're curious, if you want to read more about this, you can read this paper. So when I say testimony, I don't mean like legal testimony in a court of law. I mean the way philosophers use the term. We talk about testimony as just ordinary day-to-day -day talking to other people. And it basically, the idea is I get information from hearing you tell me what you saw or what you heard happen. And the idea here is that I, I need to rely on what other people tell me happened for most of what I know about the world. I wouldn't have very much knowledge of the world if I only knew the things that I personally observed. And so we are very heavily dependent, all of us, on trusting others' testimony. But for this to work, we have to have some norms. We have to believe that people are sincere, they mean what they say, and they're competent. They know what they're talking about. We have to believe that. And norms are how we hold people accountable. If people talk about things they don't know about or if they lie, we hold them accountable for their bad, bad practices of testimony. I take it that that's, that's how we used to do things. That's how most face-to-face -face conversation still works. But that's actually not true on social media to an increasing extent. And you can see this if you can think about the Twitter slogan. A retweet is not an endorsement. A retweet is just tweeting back out something someone else tweeted. And a retweet is not an endorsement as you saying, oh, I don't really, I don't necessarily agree with this. I'm just, without comment, putting it back out there for other people to read over again. Okay, so a retweet is not an endorsement, is a suggestion that I'm not responsible for this thing I'm passing along to other people. We can see an example of this from this tweet by Donald Trump. This is before he was the president. This is about three years ago, but it was during the campaign. And what's key in this tweet is a link he has at the bottom. And this link, if you follow it through, goes to the following infographic alleged US crime statistics. I want you to focus on this one right here that claims that 81% of all whites killed in the United States are killed by blacks. This is a lie. This is a made-up statistic. Some reporters investigated and tracked it down to a white supremacist website. There is no data behind this whatsoever. It is just flatly a lie. So when Donald Trump was questioned, why did you tweet out this thing that is inflammatory, white supremacist nonsense, his response on Fox News was, am I gonna check every statistic? All it was was a retweet. It wasn't from me. The idea is, when you're retweeting, you're not responsible. All you're doing is just passing it along for other people to think about. But the problem here is that we still have some remnants of non-social media testimony. We still think that when people pass on information to us, when they share a piece of news, that they're telling us, oh, I kind of checked this out, I trust it. We, seem to, we, we treat it half as if people are reliable when they pass on fake news or any other piece of news. And then we also, at the same time, don't hold them accountable in the same way when it turns out to be a lie. And that's a problem. It's eroding the expectation that the discussion we have with each other on social media is responsible to being true and responsible to being competent. So I want to claim that these three things working together are a loss of trust in the sincerity of others, or willingness to treat them as bots or trolls, the fact that the social media platforms make money off of us getting angry, and the fact that we are increasingly less assuming, we, we, we less require that people are truthful and honest and know what they're talking about on social media. All these things are working together, I think, to pull us back from this norm, this politics of communal deliberation that Bernard Williams laid out, where, what's, where in order to have a politics, we have to uh, allow people to argue with us and disagree with us. Once we've pushed to a point where we don't really expect people to tell the truth and we don't even treat them as real people, they're just bots, and we just don't care all, the whole thing is about fighting on the internet, then increasingly we don't have a politics of communal deliberation. We have at best the politics of acknowledgement where people are expected to do what we say and at best we'll give them some time to shape up before we punish them for it. Now, what can we do with this? My last few minutes, I want to talk to you about some ideas I have, some suggestions for what I think we can do to improve things, to make our, make our, our social media discussion better and closer to a genuine politics of communal deliberation. And I want to suggest that the responsibility here is primarily on us, on the users of social media. In the end, we're the ones who have to shape up and have to behave better. But it's unreasonable to expect us to do it all ourselves. What I want to suggest is that what we need is for the social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter and other social media sites, to provide us with tools, what I'm calling deliberation infrastructure, that help us remember that what we're doing is engaging with other people, and remember that it's important to engage with them as fellow citizens in a democratic society. 
And the model here is just very simple things like the pavement lines on a public walkway that tell you one side is for walking, one side is for cycling. The lines don't force you to do anything. They can't stop you, but good people who mean well will generally obey them because it's better to make everything work out and not crash into each other all the time. So what I want is for the social media platforms to give us similar guidelines, to give us just subtle things that help us to behave better without forcing us to do anything. So let me give you two examples of this. One of them I'm borrowing. This comes from a uh, creative agency called IA, a design agency. I'm just borrowing this from them. I encourage you to go take a look at their website and look at this in more detail. But their suggestion is that we use formatting on social media, particularly on Twitter, to be able to identify trolls. So, I'm uh, sorry, not trolls, bots. Bots, you can identify bots. So you can use computer science methods to detect pretty reliably who's a bot and who's a real person. And the idea is that bots post at a particular frequency, at a particular speed, that's distinctive of non-humans typing. And so Twitter has a pretty good idea already, or at least it could have a pretty good idea, of who are likely to be the bots and who are real people. And Twitter could just automatically display that information to all of us by changing the formatting. They could use a different font. So that's the example here. Things that are detected by Twitter are likely to be posted by bots appear in a different font than things are po likely posted by people. It would be a very simple change. It wouldn't force anyone to do anything differently. You'd still see everything you wanted in your feed, but there'd be a little cue there to help you identify what's likely coming from a bot and what's likely coming from a real person, and that would help gauge your responses. Second example has to do with Facebook and fake news. So right after the US presidential election, Facebook announced that it was going to do a new thing where when you posted a story, if independent fact checkers said it was disputed and might be fake news, then they would give you a little box saying, are you sure you really want to post this? And you could still do it. They wouldn't stop you, but you had to click the box first. After a year, Facebook took that down. They said that feature didn't work, and they tried something different where they started posting alternative stories next to all disputed stories. But I think that Facebook ought to have stuck with its original plan. I think that was actually a good idea, asking people to click through. They wanted to post disputed stories. And I think they should have gone one step further. I think they should have recorded data on who did that. I think they should have kept track of who still shared things, even after being warned that it was disputed. And I think they should have given us a subtle display of how often people share things like fake news. So it, all I'm imagining here is this little dot next to your name and next to your icon. And then maybe it's green if you haven't been sharing fake news, and it's yellow if you do sometimes, and it's red if you have a history of repeatedly sharing fake news. Now there's lots of worries you might have here. You might say, who decides what's fake? Facebook's, an Facebook's answer is they go to independent fact checkers. You might worry, is this kind of surveillance? That's a fair worry too. Here's the problem though. It turns out Facebook is already doing a lot of this. So just a month ago, there was an expose in the Washington Post. In fact, Facebook is doing most of what I just said. It is, in fact, keeping track of how all of its individual users interact with fake news on the platform. It's a little bit more subtle here. It has to do not with what you share, but with what you react to and what you try to label as fake news. But the point is Facebook is keeping track of this data, but it's not sharing it. It's not transparent. You can't get your own score. You can't get other people's scores. And I'm suggesting that Facebook already has this information. If it shared it with us, if it showed us those little colored dots next to people's names, then it would give us a starting point for thinking about, is this person who has a track record of being responsible? This would not be censorship. It wouldn't stop anyone from posting anything they want to. But it would just give us that little bit, that infrastructure that lets the rest of us have a sense of who we're interacting with when we engage with strangers on the internet. My hope is that by having these kinds of bits of infrastructure, the little, the changing format for bots, and maybe the little indicator of people who've shared fake news in the past, gives us a way of mentally checking. Not everybody you're engaging with is lying to you or is a robot. A lot of people are real, ordinary people who just disagree with you on the internet. So my hope is that this kind of infrastructure gives us a way of sorting mentally in, very quickly while we're engaging with people on the internet so we can engage with them as citizens who disagree with us, not just as obstacles to our being able to have a good time on the internet. And hopefully if that sort of thing works, then we'll be closer to realizing the internet and realizing social media as a source of democracy rather than something getting in the way. Thank you.